In Texas, it's not possible to grasp the state's sweeping cuts to family planning without understanding the root cause, abortion. Every January, thousands of Texans march to the Capitol to protest the anniversary of the U.S. Supreme Court's decision to legalize the procedure. The state's top elected officials, all of them Republican, stand firmly on one side. Texas has been a national leader in the fight to protect unborn children. The legal fight over abortion rights began 39 years ago. In the landmark case known as Roe v. Wade, Texas attorneys sought to uphold the state's ban on elective abortions. In a 7-2 decision, the justices ruled in favor of the plaintiff's argument, made by a then 26-year-old UT Austin law graduate named Sarah Weddington. We are not here to advocate abortion. We do not ask this court to rule that abortion is good or desirable in any particular situation. We are here to advocate that the decision as to whether or not a particular woman will continue to carry or will terminate a pregnancy is a decision that should be made by that individual. That in fact she has a constitutional right to make that decision for herself. The outcome of Roe v. Wade lifted restrictions on abortions in the first trimester. In the eyes of reproductive rights advocates, that 1973 ruling marked the end of so-called back-alley abortions illegal operations that were thought to have caused botched surgeries and even deaths among women dealing with unintended pregnancies. Opponents wasted no time trying to overturn the law, an effort that continues today. After Roe versus Wade, you didn't give up, you didn't quit, you didn't capitulate on your commitment to life. You kept fighting to restore the sanctity of life, one life at a time, and yes, one law at a time. Texas has followed Congress's lead. Since 1976, the Hyde Amendment has prohibited the use of Medicaid funds to help poor women access abortions, except in cases of rape, incest, or where the mother's life would be endangered without the procedure. In 1992, the High Court upheld basic abortion rights, but allowed states to enact their own restrictions. For Texas, that has translated over the years into laws requiring parental consent for minors seeking a termination, state-mandated counseling on abortion alternatives, and a 24-hour waiting period that often forces patients to make multiple visits. NARAL Pro-Choice Texas Executive Director Sarah Cleveland says hostility against abortion has escalated, especially among all but a handful of Republicans. Texas is actually one of the worst states in the nation when it comes to abortion rights for women. What we found is that politicians recognize that when they bring up the issue of choice in their political campaigns, they see that they can reap great political rewards. Our traditional values are under assault by Washington, but you can, you can rely on the fact that in Texas we're fighting tooth and nail to protect the unborn. The anti-choice groups tend to vote more often and tend to vote that issue more frequently than pro-choice voters, even though pro-choice voters are still in the majority. The abortion rights side lost additional ground during the 2011 legislative session when Texas lawmakers enacted what some called the most anti-abortion agenda in years. If government intrusion is bad, why is government intrusion with my uterus okay? They drastically reduced family planning funding, used for preventive services like cancer detection and birth control, as a way of targeting state health providers affiliated with abortion clinics. Though they cut nearly every other part of the state budget, they slightly increased funding for pregnancy resource centers and created Choose Life license plates to benefit adoption causes. But the abortion opponent's signature piece of legislation was House Bill 15. They must display the live sonogram images so the we, woman may view them. The law requires women seeking an abortion to receive a sonogram at least 24 hours ahead of the procedure. The same doctor administering the abortion must perform the ultrasound. The physician is also required to describe the limbs and measurements of the fetus and play the heartbeat aloud. Over the course of five months, Texas Attorney General Greg Abbott beat back legal challenges to the rule. It took effect on January 28, 2012. Texas women who are considering abortion will now see a sonogram of their baby and hear that baby's heartbeat in the hope they will choose life for that child. 
The new law has the strong support of abortion foes. Joe Poyman is the executive director of the Catholic organization Texas Alliance for Life. We think that is just basic medical care and the sonogram law is really about raising the standard of care for informed consent for a woman considering abortion to the level that she or you and I would expect for any other medical or surgical procedure in Texas. I cannot think of a single procedure that we do that has this power of state interference. Dr. Bruce Malone is immediate past president of the Texas Medical Association. Though the group takes no formal position on abortion, Malone says the key provisions in the state's sonogram mandate are medically unnecessary and interfere with the doctor-patient relationship. It's been very stressful for our members. I respect anyone's personal feelings about abortion. That's their personal feelings. But what I don't want it to do is interfere with the ability for the doctor and the patient to decide what's best for the patient. The state's law has also led to unintended consequences for some women, like Carolyn Jones. Already a mother of one, Jones and her husband wanted a second child. She was 20 weeks pregnant when they learned in February that the baby had serious fetal anomalies. They were told there was a chance he would not make it to term, and if he did, he would probably suffer debilitating medical problems. Doctors advised the couple to consider their options, including abortion. It was the worst decision we've ever had to make in our entire lives. But we decided that what was best for our child was to save him from having a life of pain that we would be able to do nothing about. The sonogram law had just taken effect, and many clinics had not yet been informed that cases like Jones were exempt. When she and her husband reached the painful decision to terminate her pregnancy at a Planned Parenthood clinic, she endured yet another sonogram, followed by a 24-hour waiting period. It was so upsetting to have to see those images on the screen again, um, um, especially since there was no medical purpose. We'd already received our diagnosis. We'd made our decision. Despite the misunderstanding, she says she does not blame Planned Parenthood or the doctor who treated her. He was a very kind man. You could see he did not want to do it, but he said to me I could lose my license. And I respect that. You know, they do a very important job and they have to be very careful about you know, following the letter of the law because one misstep and the entire clinic could be shut down. I think they're probably always trying to figure out how to restrict things, how to make a barrier for access, how to make it more difficult for women to obtain services. Amy Hagstrom Miller is founder and CEO of Whole Woman's Health, which operates five abortion clinics statewide. She says their work has never been more challenging. A lot of our physicians are older. Some of them travel 1,200, 1,500 miles a week just to be able to provide services for women in the communities we need them to. And so having to add a day where they're talking to the woman and they're not able to provide the surgery and they have to travel a little bit more has been really difficult um, for the physicians, trying to educate the staff and the physicians about the requirements of the law to comply. It's really been challenging for us to sort of maintain the level of care that we're committed to but also feel like we can be safe and that we can trust each other and that we're working in coalition with our patients and not, you know, against them. By state law, patients who come here must undergo counseling and sign several consent forms. They must also take home a state brochure that the Texas Medical Association has deemed medically inaccurate, in particular for its claims connecting abortion to breast cancer. Abortion providers say they have no choice but to hand out the information, which includes listings for non-abortion services, like locations of crisis pregnancy centers, and safety net programs like Children's Medicaid. In a way, it's just completely removed autonomy for the patients that we see, and it's also removed the autonomy for the staff members, too, and what their beliefs might be. We have a motto here, and it's, we trust women. It doesn't just stop at making sure that we get the procedure done, because it's, you know, if she doesn't want the procedure and we've counseled her and we've decided that she's just not at peace with her decision, then that's that. And we do turn a lot of women away. Despite Texas's efforts, abortion is not uncommon. National studies by the Guttmacher Institute, a research organization, show that one in three American women will have an abortion by the age of 45. Sixty percent of them already have at least one child. Less than one percent of patients experience complications. In Texas, the most current data indicates an average of 77,000 women received an abortion each year between 2004 and 2009, 
most of them between the ages of 20 and 24. The procedure is rarely covered by private insurance. The only assistance available to poor women comes from private funds and grants raised by abortion rights groups. I feel like I can't say it enough that women have always had abortion and that with more and more restrictions that we pass, it becomes harder for women to access, it becomes more expensive, and I worry about some public health issues that we might be facing when women can't afford access or they can't travel for access, they can't pay for services, how women might be trying to get abortions anyway. Joe Poyman says the anti-abortion movement will continue to find ways to regulate abortion clinics. In upcoming sessions, they may resurrect attempts to reform judicial bypass rules that allow minors to go around their parents to seek an abortion. Some abortion opponents even want to end exceptions for pregnancies resulting from rape and incest. Those are cases we have to really stop and think about what's best for the woman and what's best for the unborn child. and. Many times the abortion, we have been told, can be more traumatic to the woman emotionally than the actual rape. And we're really thinking are, there are two patients involved here, the woman and the unborn child, and should we encourage that woman to be an aggressor someone who is involved in taking the life of her, un her own unborn child. One thing all sides acknowledge, efforts to ban abortion outright will go nowhere as long as Roe v. Wade is the law of the land. Until we get some different opinions on the U.S. Supreme Court, the hands of the Texas legislature are tied. We, we can't ban abortion. That's the reality. So in the short term, then, what we do is to promote compassionate alternatives to abortion. We have already seen a significant decrease in accessibility due to a number of these different laws that have passed. However, really only the Supreme Court will truly be able to tell us how far is too far. Reporting in Austin, this is Tan Tan with the Texas Tribune.